Hello, everyone. Once again, my name is Langston Clark, and I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at San Antonio, who is contributing to the African Americans in Sport pod class with Dr. Alvin Logan and soon to be Dr. Brandon Crooms. Uh, today, we have a special guest, Dr. David Wiggins, who is one of the foremost African American sports historians. Uh, Dr. Wiggins is an emeritus faculty member at George Mason University. And for those of you who are students and don't know what emeritus means, it basically means that Dr. Wiggins retired with honors. And so like some of you are gonna retire with honors or on a Dean's list from UTSA, from UT Austin, or um, Washington University, Washington State University, wherever you are. It's, it's kind of like graduating with high honors um, because of the good work that you've done while you were in your career. Um, so just again, wanna thank Dr. Wiggins for taking the time to participate with us today um, and just want you to know, Dr. Wiggins, that you're our first guest. So um, we want to have the opportunity to one, like get your perspective on the African American sport experience um, throughout history. Then also, if you can give us some insights about what I think is your latest book, More Than a Game, A History of, African, of the African American Experience in Sport. Um, and so before we begin, I just want to know, can you just tell us a little bit about your journey into becoming a sports historian and what, what piqued your interest in chronicling uh, the history and the stories of black athletes in the United States? Uh, well, first of all, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I appreciate having an opportunity to talk to you, Langston, about, uh, about the African-American experience in sport. Um, I was a high school and college athlete, first of all. And um, competed, um, I was a baseball and a, and a, and a football player. Um, but I think I was decidedly different than many of my teammates in that not only did I love to compete and participate, actively participate in sport, but I was also a, um, an avid reader of sport. I was an avid follower of sport. Um, in many regards, I was I was always a fan of sport um, and actually a voracious reader of sport, anything that I could get my hands on. Um, you know, I, I, I um, subscribed to Sports Illustrated when it first came out in 1954. I read uh, the sports section of <laughs> the LA Times. I grew up in California. Um, and uh, so I, I'm always a big, big fan of uh, of sport. Mm. Um, in the um, the summer of 1971, mm -hmm. I played um, I played for a baseball team, and in, in of all places, uh, Fairbanks, Alaska. Wow, Alaska. It was, yes, it was uh, <laughs> a, a well known team called the Alaska Gold Panners, mm. and uh, actually the uh, the best team of that I had ever participated on everybody on that team it was made up of of college baseball players um, and it was it was really an outstanding club the best baseball team I actually best sports team I ever participated in mm. um, you know um, our left fielder was Rod Boone who uh, the uh, uncle or the the uh, brother of Bob Boone, longtime catcher of the Philadelphia Phillies, and the uncle to Aaron and Brett Boone, future major leaguers, and the son of Ray Boone, who was a great shortstop for the Cleveland Indians, but also on that team was, uh, maybe this is a name you're familiar with, but Dave Winfield was on that team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, who would become a great player with the San Diego Padres and New York Yankees and a future Hall of Famer. He was also a member of that club. But Oh, wow. But I, I, uh, I played on that team in 1971, and I played for a, a, a guy by the name of Jim Dietz, mm -hmm. who just accepted the head baseball job at San Diego State University. Uh, at the time, I, I, I played two years at Oregon State University, but I loved Jim Dietz, and I decided to transfer. And I'm telling you this story because it has a, <laughs> it does mm -hmm. have a, uh, it does contribute to uh, my story about it. The African American involvement in sport, but I decided to transfer 
from Oregon State to San Diego State just simply to play for Jim Dietz. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there are so many things in life that are serendipitous. And I, I only went to San Diego State because of baseball. But what happened, but what happened is I, um, at the time, I thought I wanted to be a, a physical educator and coach. And, um, and, and because of that, uh, I had to declare a minor area of study. So I majored in kinesiology, but I minored in American history mm. um, because I always had a love for history uh, as well as sport. And I ended up taking courses um, a number of courses in history, and I took my first courses in sport history. Mm. Uh, and I knew right then, <laughs> quite frankly, what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. But I took courses in history, in sport history, and I became um, enamored with, uh, quite frankly, and um, just very, very interested in. Um, the African American athlete. You have to remember this is the early this is the early 1970s. Yeah. When um, when Black history there was there was a real regard and real um, interest in um, the history of, of, of African Americans more generally, but also mm -hmm. uh, kind of really a, 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 a now an interest in the African American athlete. I became enamored with it and. And uh, it, it really, I always consider that kind of the beginning of my academic career. Wow. Uh, I, I was, I decided to focus in on uh, um, the African-American involvement in sport. Um, stayed at San Diego State, took my bachelor's degree, stayed there, took my master's degree. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I knew I wanted to become a professor and decided to, uh, to head to the University of uh, Maryland, where I took my PhD mm. in uh, in kinesiology, but with a minor area in sport history. Wow! And the philosophy of sport. Mm -hmm. And for my dissertation, I uh, and people are always a bit, I think amazed about this, but but for my dissertation, I did a uh, <laughs> a nearly five hundred page dissertation. Wait a minute, Doctor Wiggins. <laughs> 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 500 pages nearly nearly oh my God. in kinesiology nearly. yeah I, i'm what, surprised but, they let you do that but what it it was uh what i decided to do was i i took a look at uh sport leisure time activities recreational pursuits of slaves living on southern plantations during the antebellum period mm. um you know, as horrendous and cruel and inhumane as the institution of slavery was, I I, I thought, well, how did how did slaves survive? Mm. How did how did they uh, how did how did they continue to exist and and how did they find um, meaning out of their lives? And so I decided to take a look and uh, examine uh, what they did in those off hours. Those those brief periods of leisure that they did have. And so I, did, I decided to, uh, to do that for my dissertation. And um, I guess you could say <laughs> the rest of history. And right. I, continued, I continued my academic career and, and have focused in on uh, various aspects of the African-American experience in sport. Wow. I never knew that because I assumed, I, hadn't, I, I, I had not looked up your CV, but I always assumed that you were you were you were trained in history for your doctoral degree, but well, because... well, let me. Uh, um, <laughs> my PhD is in kinesiology, but interestingly enough, um, one reason I decided to to pursue my PhD at the University of Maryland is because there was a person there by the name of Marvin H. Eiler. Mm -hmm. who was one of the founders of the North American Society for Sport History. Oh. I, I decided I wanted to work with Mar for my PhD. So I, I went to Maryland specifically to work with him. Mm. Uh, but I also went to the University of Maryland because um, it was close to the Library of Congress and uh, the National Archives and all the research facilities I needed to, to do my work. 
wow. my scholarship. But the great thing about Marv Eiler uh, is that all of his PhD students were required to take the majority of our courses in the Department of History. Wow. Um, so I'm well grounded in historical methodology and the historical research process. In fact, I ended up for my PhD program, 33 of my credits are from the Department of History. Wow. Um, in fact, the, the, so it's, I, it's, it's a bit odd, I know, but my, while, while my PhD is in kinesiology, the large majority of my courses are actually from the Department of History. Wow. Uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I benefited from Marvin Eiler's decision to send all of his students over, over to the history department. That's very um, interesting. In fact, one of my, um, one of my minor professors um, was from the Department of History. We were required to have somebody from an outside discipline. Mm. And James Gilbert, uh, mm -hmm. whose name you might not know, but James was, was an outstanding historian. And uh, he was on my PhD uh, co committee. So, um, so no, a lot of my, my preparation, I always tell people my preparation really was in history as much wow. as it was kinesiology. That's interesting. Yeah. I'm, mm, that, that's, that's insightful um, for me personally, like just thinking about how I have to think about the PE program here at UT San Antonio and like the future of it's direction thinking about getting graduate students and how I get them to come in and get PhDs and master's degrees. So um, that story was beneficial in multiple ways, even beyond just the context of this class. Um, and while we're, before we get into talking about your book, um, this class um, at, at, the, at the three different universities, four different universities will likely have some student athletes in there. And I'm just, since you're talking about it, can you, what, what sort of advice or um, insights can you give to student athletes who maybe are considering going to graduate school or who maybe aren't even considering going to graduate school? How, did, how are you able to make that transition from being athlete to being an academic? Uh, good question. Um, the 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 student athletes that I used to advise when I was at George Mason, and prior to that time, by the way, I, I spent 10 years at Kansas State University in Manhattan, mm -hmm. Kansas. So the student athletes that I advised at Kansas State as well as George Mason University, I'd always tell them that hold on to your dreams, continue to hone your, your talents athletically, try to go as far as you can possibly go as an athlete. Um, but also remember that it's very, very important. This is the way I always phrased it. It's very, very important to establish, if you, can, if you possibly can, a non-sport related identity. Mm. That it's important not just to think of, of yourself as an athlete, but you should think of yourself as more than just an athlete. Um, because ultimately for all of us, our athletic career is end. Yeah. And what does one have left? Um, you know, it, you've got the rest of your life for most of us. It is true that, you know, very, very, very few, uh, folks ever play intercollegiate athletics. Yeah. Very, 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 very few ever play professional sport. And those that do pro play professional sport are looking at very, very brief, brief careers. So you've got to prepare yourself for life after football or life after basketball or life after baseball. So it's important to try to, uh, to, you, to do your absolute best in the classroom, to do your absolute best academically as well as athletically. Yeah. Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to ease the transition once your athletic career is complete. Yeah. Um, you know, of course, I preach that, but I'm not <laughs> whether 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 folks were always listening to me or not. I don't know, but uh, that's that's the advice that I always give to my student athletes, both at Kansas State as well as uh, as well as George Mason University. Yeah, I appreciate that. I I hope that it helps um, 
with the fact that you mentioned you, you were a student athlete, you were an athlete um, at a higher level than I ever participated in sports. And I, I think hearing those stories from folks like you and some other people that I know who are academics and, and were student athletes, I, I think it resonates a little bit better with the students than, than me yeah. saying it, you know, so I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, hopefully, you know, hopefully you have uh, a bit of credibility uh, that that uh, that my my student athletes listen to me, because um, I think it's you know I think it's for, again I think it's I think it's important to 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 let folks know that um, you know hold on to those dreams do do the best that you can at, athletically uh, and and reach and, and go as far as you possibly can but but I think it's important to have a uh, a fallback, if you will, yeah. and, and to try to find meaning, meaning and uh, a sense of identity and in, in, in non-sport related kinds of activities, because uh, it's important for the rest of your life. Yeah. So um, thinking about thinking about your book, um, I, I hadn't had a chance to read the entire thing, uh, but I, I did take take a look at it and, and read some some aspects, some some excerpts from some of the chapters, and I was delighted to see how. So I was a TA for Dr. Harrison when he taught African Americans in sport, and have taught it on my own. And so um, both my colleagues Alvin and Brandon are doing the same thing in their respective institutions. And I noticed that the book, the way you outline the book, is very similar to the way Dr. Harrison outlines his class. Um, in the way that we're outlining the class. And so um, was wondering if, because so we, we, we typically begin with enslavement and kind of bring us all the way into the current sort of uh, social, social context for black student athletes or just black athletes in general, um, which is, I guess, in the book, what is considered the altered athletic landscape. And so I was wondering if you could just kind of talk about any recurring historical themes that you see from from the periods of enslavement all the way through the modern day that that kind of connect the historical with the contemporary what what are some recurring themes that you've seen in your research or maybe outlined in the book well certainly one of the things that you see you know african american athletes they have been the participants um and throughout history in most instances, in most cases, um, they, those who have been in charge of and in control of sport have been predominantly um, folks from the predominantly white community. You know, um, it's, the, they, they have been the one in, in, in charge of, of the athletic activities. However, what I what I wanted to make clear, one of the things I wanted to make clear in, in more than a game, mm. one of the things I wanted to make clear to folks is what was taking place behind what I refer to, maybe you, you saw this these terms, what I wanted to make clear is what was taking place behind um, the walls of segregation. Um, you know, folks tend to know, at least I think they tend to know, mm -hmm. a little bit about um, Negro League Baseball, for example. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's the, one, that's the one thing that folks tend to know about. They, they know Negro League Baseball. They, many, many people know about Josh Gibson and Satchel Paige and Oscar Charleston. Um, uh, Cole Papa Bell and, and athletes of those stripe, but but far fewer people know about the other sports organizations that were uh, that were created by the African American community. Mm. Um, and and by and I know your background, Langston. How many people really know much about the history of sport? among historical black colleges and universities very, very few yeah very, very few very very few yeah um, i mean how, how many know about the various rivalries that took place among hbcus the football the thanksgiving day football rivalries that took place among hbcus 
uh, how many people know that there was an there was an all black car racing association? Mm. How many know about the New York Renaissance Five, the great all black basketball team? Um, many people know a little bit about the Harlem Globetrotters, but no, very few people know about the New York Renaissance Five. Or how many people realize there was an all black uh, tennis association or all black golf association? Um, you know, I could go down, <clears throat> I could go down the list, but um, that's one of the things I wanted to make clear in this book. I just didn't want to talk about, while it's important, I just didn't want to talk about the integration of Major League Baseball or the integration yeah. of, of the National Football League, but wanted to make people aware that there was, there was, there was an, uh, another pattern of sport taking place behind, behind racial segregation that, that very few folks really, really know too much about. Yeah. Um, uh, but, but to kind of get back specifically to your question, there's, mm -hmm. there's no doubt that throughout history that 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 African American athletes have been the performers, if you will, the participants, but oftentimes found themselves in a situation where where the leagues and organizations in which they participated in were run by were run by um, largely white entrepreneurs and white owners and what and clubs that were coached by by whites rather than African Americans. Yeah. Um, the, in other words, the leadership uh, element of sport was really largely in the, in the hands of, of, of whites rather than African Americans. Yeah. That's that's certainly a that's certainly a um, one of the themes throughout throughout uh, throughout our history. Yeah. This this kind of brings me to um, a question that I had about I think it's in chapter three where it talks about how I think it was some of the presidents of HBCUs. I think it was two presidents of HBCUs wanted to establish their own national league or organization for black college sports. And I was wondering if you could talk, because I, I know we have, they, they had their own um, conferences, right? The beginnings of the, of the black conferences, but at a national level saying it's its own NCAA. Um, could you give us some insight into that? And then maybe talk about like, what do you think would have happened if, if the black colleges had established their own national intercollegiate athletic organization. Yeah, they, they talked about it, but it never really came to fruition. You know, they, I don't know. I think, I think part of the problem was, was uh, just having the financial wherewithal to pull, to pull it off. Mm. I, just don't think, I just don't think they could pull it off financially. But the important thing is, is they wanted to, uh, they wanted to have their own sense of empowerment. They were, they were yearning for, uh, quite frankly, they were yearning for a sense of agency yeah. and, and control that they just simply didn't think they had otherwise. Uh, but there's certainly, there were, yeah, there was, there was continual discussions about creating their own their own national organization, but ultimately, ultimately, they just they just simply couldn't pull it off. And again, I think it had a great deal to do with uh, the lack of finances to, to 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 pull it off. So they always historical black college and university always found themselves really um, being controlled by by the uh, by the NCAA. Yeah, and. Um, uh, for for well for better or worse, um, but having said that, I mean they did have they did have the important thing to note about HBCUs. Of course, they did have their own leagues, their own organizations. Yeah. Um, yeah. The the uh, the oldest one would be the um, well initially referred to as the Colored Intercollegiate Athletic Association that was established in 1912. Would eventually become the uh, the Central Intercollegiate Athletic Association. Um, that is still in existence to this very day. Yeah. The CIAA is still in existence. And um, <laughs> I'm not so sure there's anything more memorable, from, at least based on the conversations that I've had with people, more memorable than the CIAA 
year-end basketball tournament that is yeah. held on an annual basis. So they they did have, and there were, you know, there were, uh, HBCUs, of course, had their own organizations in the Deep South, too, not just the Central Intercollegiate Athletic Association was initially made up of schools like Howard yeah. University and, and Hampton uh, and Virginia State and institutions like that. But, they, but uh, HBCUs in the Deep South also had their own, uh, their own athletic organizations. So while they did not have what, we, their, what was comparable to the NCAA, mm. they, they did have smaller organizational structures um, which help guide their uh, their their athletic programs. Yeah, um, I want to just take us back to uh, the period of enslavement, um, and I know that you you mentioned in the book that you know some 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 enslaved black folk uh, who were athletic had had relative freedom. Um, and were in some cases able to 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 earn to to earn their freedom, and I say that in quotation marks. Um, can you talk a little bit about about that? Because when when I read that, like I was thinking about, in some ways, the freedoms that like premier athletes in in the modern era have. Right? They can they they have latitude that. Um, a lot of the average black black folk don't feel like they have to do that, that 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 they can have like they have a type of agency that the average black person doesn't have and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, we there was there was a selected number of of uh, slaves, uh, enormously talented and gifted slaves who. Um, we're able, yeah, you're right. We're able to realize a sense of agency, a sense of um, a sense of freedom uh, that was unable that most slaves were unav- unable to realize. Quite frankly, mm-hmm. you know, one of those one of those athletes was a was a boxer by the name. I talk a little bit about just as an example. I talk a little bit about uh, a slave by the name of Tom Molyneux. Mm who was an extraordinarily gifted pugilist, boxer, who fought matches on behalf of his owner. And legend has it, and I say legend has it because mm-hmm. I, I don't have any hard face fast data on this, but legend has it that he won so much money for his owner that he was granted his freedom. And actually, eventually, Tom Molyneux eventually found his way to... Um, to England, mm. where he fought um, the great white boxer Tom Cribb twice for the heavyweight championship of the world, and so Molyneux was one of those one of those ex-slaves that yeah he found a sense of uh, an important sense of mobility, a sense of freedom that uh, was not able to realize for the vast majority of of folks living in uh, under the under the under the institution. Um, there were also um, a number of very talented slave jockeys mm. who um, were able to travel, we think were able to travel around the country and, and, and ride horses for their, their owners. And uh, actually evidently made money um, and uh, had a sense of mobility and a sense of freedom unable to be realized by the vast majority of, of, uh, of slaves at that particular period of time. The important thing to note, I think, however, is that mm-hmm. they were still slaves. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they were still, they were still owned, if yeah. you will. Um, the, ultimately, they were still under the control of somebody else. Um, and at least the vast majority of them. And so, um, you know, there's still that, that system in place, um, un- unfortunately, but, but you're right. They were, they were, um, they, they were, um, slave with some slaves with privileges, if you will. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
um, they were not ordinary field hands or they were not slaves living in the big house um, waiting on uh, the white master and his family. So, so they, were, they were privileged in some ways. Um, and it's, it's kind of, in a, in a, but, but, but very few, I'm not talking about, I don't think we're talking about a large number of folks, but there were a privileged few like that. Yeah. Yeah. So we have, we have, um, you know, those who were enslaved, who were athletes um, within the institution of slavery. And then um, we get to, um, I, think, I think in chapter four, it talks about um, some African Americans who were in institutions of higher education. And it talks about how, you know, these, these brothers and sisters made, um, made their alma maters proud. And um, Jesse Owens, I think, is mentioned in that chapter, um, having gone to Ohio State. Like Jesse, I went because like I went to Ohio State for my master's degree, so they have a whole building named after Jesse Owens. Um, but I always remember those stories about how, when Jesse Owens' career was over, he had to race horses. Like it, it was like a, he was like a showman. He wasn't really revered in the same way he should have been as an American hero. But then we have these. These other um, former athletes who went on to get PhDs and law degrees and had some political positions and things like that. Could you talk about those African Americans who were able, even like back in the earlier 1900s, to, to leverage uh, sports or their education to be aspirational in other aspects of life? Yeah, I think well, there were there were a number of predominantly white institutions that yes, that did recruit African American athletes to their institutions. You know, predominantly white institutions. When I say predominantly white institutions, I'm I'm thinking of you know maybe the I'm thinking those institutions, for example, in the Big Ten, mm -hmm. Ohio State, University of Michigan, University of Iowa. Yeah, they were interested, always interested in institutional prestige. And one of the ways in which one realized a degree of institutional prestige is through athletics. Mm. And, so, and so they ended up, in the early part of the 20th century, they ended up recruiting the elite of the elite African-American athletes. And many of those athletes were indeed outstanding students as well as outstanding athletes and many of them did go on to extraordinary careers after their athletic careers were over wherever wherever they competed you know one of the famous athletes of that stripe would be uh, paul robeson for example mm. yeah paul robeson was was an extraordinarily gifted all-around athlete at rutgers but also an outstanding student, Phi Beta Kappa, who was one of those kinds of people. But but there are a number of athletes of, of, of that of that type. So so yeah, many of these predominantly white institutions interested in international prestige recruited these kinds of folks. Now, now not all of them, however, it's important to know not all of them were were um, were gifted both athletically as well as academically. And you mentioned Jesse Owens. Jesse Owens was not was not somebody was not a particularly good student. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, it's not that he was not a good student because he's innately not able to do the work. I just don't think Jesse really cared much about what was going on in the classroom. He just didn't spend as much time mm -hmm. academically as well as as he did <laughs> athletically. Um, and he never graduated from Ohio State, interestingly enough. I didn't know that. No, he never graduated. Mm. Um, um, he just didn't spend much time. And there are athletes like that, of course, who, like Jesse, who just didn't devote much effort and, and hone their talents academically like they did athletically. But you're right. There are a number of, of, of famous and well-known people that, that – um, uh, African American athletes were also outstanding students who went on to to post great post athletic careers. You know, um, I'm trying to think of, of a good example to make this point. 
you know, in the 1936 Olympic Games in Berlin, mm -hmm. one, of the most, one of the most famous Olympic Games in our history, uh, we dominated, I say we, the United States dominated track and field, the track and field events Yeah. Uh, in 1936 in Berlin. And of course, that's the tra track and field is always one of the marquee events in Olympic in the Olympic Games, yeah, we we dominated track and field in 1936. We we did it largely through the efforts of um, of African American athletes. You know, Jesse Owens garnered four gold medals yeah. in Berlin in 1936. John Woodruff, the great African American middle distance runner, won the gold medal in the 800 meters. Mm. Um, Cornelius Johnson, the great African-American high jumper, won the gold medal. He was from Compton Junior College in Los Angeles. He, he got, got the gold medal. Um, Mac Robinson's, Mac Robinson, who was Jackie Robinson's older brother who, and who had competed at the University of Oregon, garnered gold medal in the 400 meter relay. We had, we had great, it was dominated by, it's, this is interesting, it was dominated by African American athletes who had mm. competed, who all of them had competed at predominantly white institutions. Wow. Um, because these are these are institutions that recruited the the very very best African American athletes. Um, um, so, but but many of them went on to great uh, great careers following their uh, yeah following their athletic performances. Um, but yeah, yeah. So you mentioned, um, you mentioned, you mentioned um, Jackie Robinson's older brother um, yeah. running in the, in the 1936 Olympics. And got has me thinking about like when we, when most people think about the integration of sports, obviously they go to Jackie Robinson um, and, and the, the Brooklyn Dodgers um and whatnot and, and in light of that i'm wondering if you could uh, explain this concept of reintegration w what is what is reintegration well what, ha what happened in the latter stages of the 19th century um following well following slavery um during the during um I'd say the first 20 to 25 years following emancipation. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things about um, sport, American sport, is for a brief time, um, African American athletes were allowed to participate at the highest levels of predominantly white organized sport. I'd say for the first 15 to 20 years following emancipation. Mm um we had a number of great african-american jockeys uh who were competing in horse racing uh, which at that time was america's number one spectator sport um for example the great isaac murphy mm -hmm. who became the first jockey ever to win back-to-back -back kentucky derbies the first jockey ever to win three kentucky derbies the first jockey ever selected to the horse racing uh, Hall of Fame in Saratoga Springs, New York. Yeah. We had the great um, Moses Fleetwood Walker played um, with the Toledo Mud Hens of the American Association, which in the 1880s had major league status. Um, Marshall Major Taylor, uh, the great African-American bicyclist from Indianapolis, Indiana was competing both nationally as well as internationally. Uh, you, had, you had these select number of great African-American athletes, again, who were, who, were, who were competing at the highest levels of predominantly white organized sport. Mm. Um, but what happens at the turn of the century Take the last decade of the 19th and around the turn of the century, as mm -hmm. most most African American athletes would be eliminated from.
from predominantly white organized sport. Wow. Um, at, again, and that's important to note. And um, what, what, what happened is African American, the large, largest majority of African American athletes like African Americans in general were um, were finding themselves um, being segregated yeah. and losing their place um, in in most predominantly white organized sport. Um, um, Jim Crow laws, the black codes, um, where uh, segregation based on race was being legalized. Um, resulted in the largest majority of African-American athletes being eliminated from um, the highest levels of predominantly white organized sport, mm -hmm. un unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but interestingly enough, with I would say with three exceptions, okay. African-American athletes would continue to be allowed to participate in the sport of boxing, a select number of African American athletes, as we just mentioned, were, would be able to continue to participate in predominantly white uh, college sport, mm -hmm. and African American athletes would would also continue to be able to participate. A select number would be able to con uh, con continue to be able to participate in a, in the Olympic Games. Mm. Um, those were those were 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 three except exceptions. So when I say reintegration, um, so at the turn of the century, most African American athletes were limited to predominantly white organized sport, and so they had to. They were forced. Most of them were forced to organize their own teams, mm -hmm. their own leagues, and their mm -hmm. own organizations with little with no white interference. Um, but it would not be until. Um, uh, the, the late 1940s and early 1950s, where those sports were once integrated again. Yeah. And that's, that's why I use the term reintegration. Yeah. And of course, the, the most famous reintegration that took place was in, was in Major League Baseball with the signing of, uh, of Jackie Robinson by the Brooklyn Dodgers. Yeah. It's, um, um, it's interesting because uh, every everybody thinks that you know you say who integrated baseball you say Jackie Robinson and in some ways it's true but it the the, the most true thing is that he he really reintegrated baseball and, and he reintegrated modern major league baseball mm -hmm. I always yeah I always tell my I think I I just mentioned this man's name just a few minutes ago but but I always tell I always told my students that Really, the first African American to play Major League Baseball was Moses Fleetwood Walker, when he signed and he played a year with the Toledo Mudhens. He was really the first African American to play Major League Baseball. But Jackie Robinson was the first African American to play what I always refer to as modern Major League Baseball. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, um, So thinking about, about Jackie Robinson, one of the things um, that I learned in my academic journey uh, was that Jackie Robinson, when he retired, that in, in some ways he was active in the civil rights movement. Maybe not in the same ways as like Dr. King and whatnot, but um, he had a voice. And it, it brings me to this next question. Um, so I don't, I don't know if you've, if you've heard of it or seen it yet, but there's there's a um, there's a movie on Amazon Prime called One Night in Miami, and it, it tells the story of Muhammad Ali, Jim Brown, Sam Cooke, and Malcolm X the night after Muhammad Ali wins his title fight against Sonny Liston. And I'm wondering if you could talk about in that civil rights era, um, the role of black athletes in civil rights um and and how that played out and maybe like the the athletic generation after jackie robinson well it is true that, certainly it is true that jackie robinson was he became actively involved once his career was over that's for sure um but 
And I think, I think the athletes, many of the athletes that followed Jackie Robinson certainly were not, were not as actively involved in the struggle as, as, as he was, you know, and I think of athletes like, I know that, you know, athletes like Michael Jordan, athletes like Tiger Woods, some of those athletes of that ilk have been criticized heavily for their lack of involvement in, in larger racial issues. Um, but that's a difficult thing. You know, yeah. I think, I think, I think for, I, I try to put myself in the shoes of Jordan and, and, and Tiger, for example. And that's difficult, you know, to do because you're trying your best to establish your, your athletic career and be successful just like anybody else. Yeah. And they, and they you just certainly don't want to do anything to, to jeopardize one's career when you've spent so many years trying to hone your talents and trying to make your way in, into, uh, in, in, in the world. So it's, you know, I'm not, I'm not one to be overly critical of, yeah. of, of those kinds of athletes. Um, I don't think we can forget though, that, um, things do begin, uh, I'm not exactly sure how to say this. The, I, I think that um, I think I don't think we can forget the importance of. For me, you can't forget the importance of Muhammad Ali and and the history of of the African American athlete. Mm -hmm. I think Muhammad Ali is is a key figure. No matter how you you cut this when you talk about the involvement of, of, of African-American athletes in the larger civil rights struggle. Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali, as far as I'm concerned, led the way. Mm. He was, and of course, I'm, <laughs> I don't know, maybe it's partly because it's, I, I grew up in that generation mm -hmm. and I was part of that, you know, I, and I, I lived through it and I saw what, the sacrifices that somebody like Ali made to the larger yeah. black power movement and civil rights struggle. You know, he ended up sacrificing, uh, you know, the, some, some prime years in his boxing career because he was an athlete who spoke out a, a, against the Vietnam war and, and was, uh, uh, spoke out vehemently about, the lack of racial justice and the lack of equality in American culture there during the 1960s and 70s. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think many people climbed on his shoulders and followed his lead. And of, and of course, two athletes that, that certainly stuck, literally stuck their neck out and followed his lead were, were Tommy Smith and John Carlos when, yeah. when the, they, um, they did their black power salute at the 1968 Olympic games in Mexico city. Um, and, uh, yeah, when I, when I think of black athletes and when I think of, of those that became involved in the civil rights struggle, Ali is, is foremost, but there, but, but, you know, during that era, there are other, there are other great African American athletes that did the same. Yeah. You know, Ali was not the only one, but I think he was the most prominent one. Yeah. But you had athletes like um, like Jimmy Brown, the great Syracuse football lacrosse All American, and 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 a great Cleveland Browns running back who yeah. who vehemently spoke out against um, the lack of racial equality in American culture. There was also the great Bill Russell, the the wonderful um, University of San Francisco basketball star and Boston Celtics star. Mm. who also uh, vehemently spoke out against uh, the lack of racial equality uh, in American culture as well. And there was other athletes of that ilk that, 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 did, that did the same thing. Mm. Um, um, and now we're seeing, now we're seeing, thankfully, now we're seeing um, other great African-American athletes are doing the exact 
same thing that Jimmy Brown and Muhammad Ali and Bill Russell did during the 1960s and 1970s. And that's, that's been a, uh, that's been empowering to, to many of us. And yeah. I, I'm, I, I applaud, I applaud uh, what's, what has taken place over the last 10 or 15 years. Yeah. Um, before we go, I have just two more questions. Um, chapter seven talks about title nine yes. and I think there's a section in there. It's something about um, black women being left out. And so I was, I was wondering if you could talk about the relationship of black women to title nine. Um, and I, I'll let you go ahead and just take over that. Well, I think, you know, I think, unfortunately, I, I, much of the history of African-American athletes, those who have written about mm -hmm. the history of African-American athletes, quite frankly, it's been about the history of, of male African-American athletes. Yeah. And so one of the things I try to do in more than a game is I, I really, I really um, made a, a genuine effort to write extensively about African-American female athletes in sport mm. um, because they just have not been adequately written about and covered and analyzed. And so I think that's actually, I, I, I think it's one of the strengths of, of the book mm. is, is the inclusion of just far more information and details uh, about African-American athletes, uh, women athletes yeah. that, has, that have been previously written about. And so I made an effort to, to do that. Um, they, they, um, they obviously deserve that. Yeah. And, and one of the things I discussed was Title IX. And one of, the, one of the points that I make is that, yes, Title IX has been extraordinarily important for women Title IX that, as you know, was passed in 1972. What we've seen because of Title IX, we've seen it, we have seen an increasing number of women who are now participating in sport. But, but the increase has been largely among white women in sport, I would argue. Mm. And with the notable exceptions of basketball and track and field, African-American women have still been left out of most sports um, with those, with the notable exceptions of basketball and track and field. Um, you know, we still see a dearth of African-American female athletes in golf and tennis and, and rowing. And, and I could go through a, a, a long of it laundry list of, of sports yeah um so they they've just been they've still continue to be left out of of um of many sports with those with those notable exceptions of basketball and uh and and, and and track and field and i could see one of my students saying now well what about serena in in track and um and uh naomi i don't want to say a name wrong osaka um, yeah and I, I think I think it's important to point out that like I think the point that you're making is is like yeah we we see these we see these few who are like dominant athletes but if you look at like everybody the representation isn't there among like the the wide span of abilities right from the best professional tennis athlete to the to the to the, to the least of the professional tennis athletes you don't see the representation there so. yeah you, you know there are the exceptions Serena and Venus they're they're exceptions you don't. Know? Yeah, when you look at when you look at tennis, for example, as a whole, no, there's still vast underrepresentation of African American female athletes in the sport. Yeah. And you could you know, you could say the exact same thing about about golf. Uh African American female golfers are, are vastly underrepresented in that sport. Um and that's one of the that's one of the interesting things. I think one one thing that happens is is people see Venus and Serena and just automatically assume that African American yeah. female athletes are re highly represented in tennis. It's just simply not true. Or, yeah. or, or people read about Tiger, 
are constantly reading about Tiger and just to say, oh my gosh, African-American athletes have fared quite well in the sport of golf. That's simply not true. They're vastly, they're vastly underrepresented. And you, you know, you asked me initially about, I think you asked me initially, Langston, about kind of themes mm -hmm. about throughout history. And certainly one of the things is, for me, one of the important things, and one of the important things to remember is that African-American athletes have been vastly underrepresented in many sports. Yeah. And, and um, overrepresented in a few others. But by and large, athlete, athletics is still a white person's game. Mm. When, you, when, you, when you think of representation. Yeah not just as, as participants, but certainly, as I mentioned previously, certain, certainly when you think about leadership roles and positions of power and control, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's very, it's, it's very, very, uh, well, I, I don't want to say it's not obvious, but, yeah. but, but it's true yeah. that, that um, is still to a great extent a, a, a white man's operation. Yeah. And, um, uh, uh, I think people need to need to be cognizant of that fact. Yeah, it's it's interesting that what what you said was very poignant even to me, and I know it. That like, I know the power the power stuff is there. It's it's a bit more obvious, I think, than the representation being in, in as the athlete. You know what I mean? Because we because in America we're like football, basketball, men's football, men's basketball are the sports. And every four years, we love track and field. And, and it's obvious there. But if we watched the whole Olympics, we, we wouldn't see the representation in all right. of the different um, types of sports that exist that we see in those few that we pick um, to look at on a regular basis. So Yeah, we, t we take a look at the marquee event of track and field in the Olympic competition. And just we see a large number of African-American athletes represented in that sport. But and just kind of make assumptions and we generalize, I think, yeah. Uh, yeah. quite a bit. You know, uh, we, one of the great stories in the reintegration of sport, of course, the greatest story is probably the story of Jackie Robinson reintegrating Major League Baseball. But just think about, just think about the represent, representation of African Americans in Major, in major League Baseball today. Yeah. African Americans are vastly underrepresented in, in Major League Baseball. Um, it's it's a sport dominated by by Latin Americans um, and and whites, not not African Americans. Uh, we just don't. We just they're just not. Yeah. Um, you know, and that <laughs> in that sport, we we oftentimes classify as the most democratic of all sports. That is, as the great leveler in society, but yet we have such underrepresentation of African Americans in that sport. It's it's it's, it's quite fascinating. Yeah. Even though even though we use the Jackie Robinson story uh, and talk about it incessantly, um, it, it's a sport that's that we see a vast underrepresentation of, of of Black Americans. Yeah. So. Last question. Um, thank you for the time that you've given us already. Sure. And so the book, the book was published in 2018, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So I have to assume that like, let's say you finished around 2017 and it had to go through the edits and the pictures and all that stuff went in there. So since the time you finished the book up until the present day, if you were going to add to the last chapter or add another chapter to the book, what what would be included um, in that last chapter? I would do I would do um, I would do a chapter on or maybe a epilogue on the book. By the way, only it's only in hardback, and I think Roman and Littlefield, who is the publisher, is is thinking about putting it in paperback. Mm -hmm. And they've asked me what I would they've asked me that same question and I told them that I would probably put it in an epilogue mm. and what I would do is I would talk about the recent activism of African-American athletes and I would talk about I would talk about and write about the WNBA mm. and the African-American women basketball players who've become actively involved in the civil rights struggle I would talk about 
certainly I would talk a lot about um, LeBron James because mm. I think he's I think he's extraordinarily important in any discussion about the recent uh, activism of African American athletes. Um, I would I would uh, <laughs> I would end up writing about. Um, uh, the current political situation. I would talk about the, the, the politics over the last four years mm. and how it has impacted um, American culture generally, but also has impacted uh, the world of sport mm. and what has resulted because of it. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's what I would, uh, that's what I would write about. Um, I, I, uh, and, and I would write, I would write further about, I, although I do it in, um, in the book, I would continue to write about Colin Kaepernick mm. and the importance of, of, of Kaepernick and all of this. I think he's a crucial figure to, uh, to talk about and, 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 and to discuss. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the. That's the kind of thing that I would put in an epilogue to the book, Langston. All right. Well, Dr. Wiggins, thank you for your time. I'm sorry we went over by a few minutes, but- um, Oh, my pleasure. Your, your insights were valuable.